Welcome to Virginia Union University's Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology Weekly Service of Worship and Prayer in Coburn Hall inside the Alex Bledsoe James Memorial Chapel. Welcome. Song is an affirmation that you can speak over your own life. It's just goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Come on y'all, let's go. Here we go. Goodness, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all uh -huh. the days of my life. Uh -huh. Goodness, come on, say it. Come on, say it again, everybody all over the world. Say, all the days. Uh huh. Uh huh. That sounds good. Come on, goodness sake. All the days. Come on, give me some harmony. Goodness and mercy, sing out. All the days. All the days of my life. Uh -huh, that sounds good. Come on, goodness, here we go. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days. Uh -huh. All the days of my life. And I will dwell. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. For Come on, clap your hands, all ye people, real big. Goodness and mercy follows me all of my days. Come on, you say goodness, come on. Goodness and mercy follows me oh. all of my days. Come on, say it one more time. Goodness, just like that. Come on. Come on, give it to me in harmony. Come on, real big. Goodness and mercy follows me oh. all of my days. Goodness and mercy, sing out. Goodness and mercy follows me oh. all of my days. All of my days. All of my days. All of The grace of God is on your life. And goodness and mercy shall stop follow you all the days of your life. God bless you. I bring you greetings from the sanctuary of the historic Six Mount Zion Baptist Church, and I am honored to be asked to share a word with you today. It will come from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 3 through 5. The Christian Standard Bible reads this way. Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there. But he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough, Lord. 
take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. In 1 Kings 18, the prophet Elijah had set up a big showdown on Mount Carmel. It was Baal versus the God of Israel. Baal's prophets came and they prayed, cried, and cut themselves but got no response. Elijah prayed and God showed up by burning wet wood. Then a few verses later, when you turn over to 1 Kings 19, we see that right after that powerful mountaintop experience, Elijah finds himself in the wilderness of despair. Queen Jezebel had flipped out when she heard about what happened on the mountain. She sent word that she was going to kill Elijah. So the prophet ran for his life and prayed for his death. When he should have been celebrating what God did in and through him, he found himself feeling inadequate and unworthy. He was a preacher in pain. And some seminarian listening today understands what that feels like because you've been on an emotional roller coaster. You've heard God's call to the ministry. You applied to the renowned seminary. You will do it. Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University. You got accepted. You took out the necessary financial aid. You're in the classes and you found out that this ain't Bible college. Your theology is being stretched. What you thought you knew to be true about God and the Bible and sin is being challenged. You're trying to manage your education and be present for the people in your household and compassionately care for your congregation. Some days are great. You feel like you're killing the game. Almost a year into a pandemic and you found a way to keep your congregation connected, even though it's a struggle. You feel like you're thriving in spite of a global pandemic, but other days you are praying for God to end it all. Because you've had to be the preacher, the teacher, the sound tech, the videographer, the lighting person, and anything else needed in this season. You're stressed out looking at the monthly income versus expenses. You have people depending on you to give them hope at a time when many feel hopeless. There are widows in your congregation struggling with loneliness, parents and teachers juggling work while making sure their children don't fall too far behind in virtual learning, teens feeling isolated because they've hit significant milestones but haven't been able to fully celebrate them. You have those who are financially unstable, hearing billionaires on TV talk about how giving them a one-time stimulus check will create a welfare state, or you have families who've been devastated by COVID-19 looking for you to tell them that things will get better, and many who are confused or concerned about the vaccination process. All the while, political and racial tensions are rising around the country. These last 12 months, have been a lot to deal with. And it would make sense today if somebody listening could relate to Elijah's prayer. You've had enough and you want it to be over. What do you do when you find yourself mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually fatigued? I believe 1 Kings 19 gives us God's treatment plan for preachers in pain. Now, these points aren't real deep, but I think they are what somebody needs to hear today. The first thing you do as a preacher in pain is take care of yourself. Verse 5 says, Elijah laid down and went to sleep. When you feel like you want to give up, get some rest. I know, I know, I wish I had something deeper to give you, but sometimes your physical needs must be met before you can properly care for your spiritual ones. When you're tired, it seems like everybody is out to get you. When you're tired, you'll feel like you're all by yourself. When you're tired, you don't make good decisions. God wants you to know that getting proper rest can change your whole perspective. The story continues that an angel woke Elijah up and the angel told Elijah, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Verse seven says the angel came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. God is so practical, y'all. Elijah was tired, so God let him sleep. Elijah was hungry. God sent an angel to provide food. God's treatment plan for preachers in pain is for you to take care of yourself. Next, you are to go where God is speaking. The angel told Elijah that he had a journey ahead of him. This meant that even though the prophet thought it was over, he prayed for it to be over. God had more in store for him. Note here that the angel didn't give Elijah any details of the journey ahead because the emphasis was still on the prophet's recuperation. But with the mention of a journey, God is giving Elijah hope for the future. When we 
or those with whom we are in relationship are fatigued, depressed, in pain, or experiencing burnout, we must remind ourselves to be gentle because recovery takes time and restoration cannot be rushed. Verse 8 says, so he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel the 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. To this point in the text, we've seen that God has physically restored Elijah through food and sleep. God has emotionally restored Elijah through the promise of a future, and God has spiritually restored him by bringing him to a sacred place. Elijah is now in a place to meet with God in an intimate way. But before that, once again, we're told that the prophet takes a nap. I love the fact that we are told three times in this chapter that Elijah sleeps. It is a reminder that, yes, he was God's prophet. But as James 5, 17 in the Amplified Version says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, with the same physical, mental, and spiritual limitations and shortcomings. So just in case you missed it the first and second time, Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go to sleep. Turn off the TV, put down the tablet, shut down the computer, put your phone on do not disturb, close your eyes and go to sleep. The next morning, God asks Elijah a question. What are you doing here? Verse 10, Elijah replied, I have served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I appreciate that this open-ended question shows up on the pages of Scripture because it allowed Elijah to express his concerns, his fears, and his frustrations to a God who was willing to listen to him share and didn't strike him down for having human emotions. This preacher in pain is having an intimate encounter with his creator. In verse 11, God instructs Elijah, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. I'm sure you're familiar with other translations that say it was a still, small voice. And I used to pray that God would heighten my hearing so that I wouldn't miss the still, small voice, but my prayer changed when I learned that in Hebrew, the words translated in English as still, small voice actually refer to silence. It literally means the voice of silence. We may be looking for God to speak in the wind or in the earthquake or other demonstrative things, but sometimes God doesn't show up until all that stuff stops. So in the sound of silence, maybe God is reminding us today that the wind won't blow forever. The earth won't tremble forever. Fire won't burn forever. My brothers and sisters, God speaks in the silence and God is saying this too shall pass. So don't make permanent decisions during temporary circumstances. Elijah had taken care of his physical needs. He had gone where God is speaking. And in verse 13, God asks again, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah gives God the same answer. He's in the middle of a close encounter with his creator, but he still hadn't seen things the way God wanted him to. And I'm relieved to know that I'm not the only one who, even in the presence of God, has struggled with changing my perspective. So after Elijah responded, the Lord gave him specific instructions for what he was to do next. STVU professor and author of Making Space at the Well, Mental Health in the Church, Dr. Jessica Young Brown writes, the Bible holds several examples of people being completely honest with God about their suffering and God responding with care, not chastisement. The prophet Elijah, after conflict with King Ahab, prayed to die. The Lord responded by sending an angel with bread and water. Only after Elijah had 40 days of rest and restoration did the Lord return and encourage the prophet to get up and move. And verse 19 says, so Elijah went from there. God's treatment plan for preachers in pain, take care of yourself, 
go where God is speaking, and finally go back and live out your calling. The Bible says Elijah went back the same way he had come, but he was walking back with a renewed sense of purpose. God's instruction today for someone is go back because I have work for you to do at home, on your job, in your relationships, in your church. There's work for you to do. In her book, Dr. Brown encourages church leaders to share their own testimonies, whether it is their struggles with mental health or experiences with therapy. So as I close, I want to live out my calling by being transparent. The lyrics of Broken by Shekinah Glory Ministry has been my testimony. God, I remember when I told you yes. I was eager to do what you told me to in obedience. Looking out in the crowd, I see eyes closed, tears falling, people praising and worshiping too. They didn't see me. God, they only saw you. It felt good, but something was missing. See, I'm empty inside and I'm wondering why. Will I ever feel what they felt from me? I didn't know the price of yes would cost me so much. I've got something to say, and I'm not sure where to start. I'm afraid to begin. It's all falling apart. God, I thought because I was working for you, everything wrong, you would undo, but it wasn't quite true. It's hard to admit that I can't feel you like I used to because I'm in ministry and I'm messed up. I'm confused with no one to talk to. I need a breakthrough because this is the thing you anointed me to do. God, I've been broken and bruised, wondering, will you still use? I'm crying out to you. Got nothing left to lose. Father, hear my plea. I need you to rescue me because I'm broken. In 2019, I was broken. As I got closer to my 40th birthday, I started focusing on where I was compared to where I wanted to be. And I remembered the life plan I had to write out as part of the social work program at Virginia Union way back in 2002. And according to that plan, by 2019, I was supposed to have a doctorate degree. I was supposed to have a spouse. I was supposed to have a child or two. I was supposed to have my own home. That was the plan. But as my birthday approached, I started to feel myself sinking into a depression. And I know it was depression because the sadness couldn't easily be shaken off. And my feelings were beginning to impact how I thought and how I acted. I felt like Elijah. My faith was fragile. I was a preacher in pain, still going to church every Sunday, still leading worship, still teaching Bible study, still praise dancing, but going home feeling lonely. And when talking to my friends didn't fix me, when I couldn't shake feeling unworthy or envious or bitter or anger, eating more than I needed to, mind racing when I should have been sleeping, when things became too much for me to handle on my own, I sought professional help. I chose a therapist who was also a believer, and she helped me to stop focusing on my problems and to start counting my blessings. Yes, there are times when people, including ministers of the gospel, will have challenges that we can't handle on our own. And I know it's not something we like to discuss in public, especially from the pulpit, but seeking professional help may be a part of God's treatment plan for you. It could literally save your life. That was 2019, standing here in 2021, about a month before I turned 42 years old, some things didn't change. I still don't have a doctorate degree. I still don't have a significant other. I'm unable to have biological children. I don't own a home. And while these things remain the same, what has changed is my perspective. And for that, I'm grateful. So as I leave you today, I encourage you to take care of your physical needs. Go where God is speaking and live out your calling so that you can fully become who God has called you to be. Let us pray. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you.
that you've enjoyed this week's worship services. May the grace and the love and peace of God be with you.